the 1930s, there was a behavioral scientist, B.F. Skinner. He had a rat he put in a box. Put a rat in a box, and uh, there was a little, little button they could push, a little lever they could pull. And uh, he tried it a bunch of different ways. He tried it a ton of different ways, actually. Uh, sometimes they would, the rat would go over and push the level, lever, and a little piece of food would come out. And uh, he would, he would kind of measure how long does it take when the rat gets in there to figure out that's what the lever does. And, and then uh, he'd take the rat out for a little, while, a little while and put the rat back in a couple days later and see if it would remember it needs to go push the little lever to get some food. Uh, he went from there, and then he decided, you know what, let's do some, some positive uh, reinforcement, negative reinforcement. So he pushed the lever, and something negative would happen. A shock would happen, something would happen, or nothing would happen. And so we went back and forth with all these variables with this rat in a box and the lever that you would push and kind of what would happen after you push the lever, right? Well, he, he kind of found, not kind of found, he definitely found that positive reinforcement created the most um, predictable behavior. That if you were pro positively reinforced, if this rat was positively reinforced, he could predict when it was going to go push the lever, how often it was going to push the lever. In fact, he got so good at it, he could predict how many times he would push the lever before he got tired of pushing the lever, right? And then he stumbled onto something that was just remarkable. Like just, it broke everything. It was just like, man, this is unbelievable. It's called variable ratio schedule. What he discovered was that if you get a reward every single time that the rat pushed the thing, eventually he got tired of the reward. And it's like, okay, I've had this little piece of whatever too many times, it's fine. But, but if he randomized, right, on a schedule, but to the rat it was random every time he pushed it, it would release it, let's say, one time every nine pushes, right? So twice in 18. But it wouldn't be on the ninth push. It would be randomly in the ninth, right? It'll happen twice in 18 pushes, but randomly throughout there. He found that the rat would just keep pushing it over and over again. In fact, it got more pushes when it was randomly assigned in a strategic way. It just wouldn't stop. It just kept doing it. It, it, it well over ate what it would typically eat if it got one for every single push. It was like its brain was hardwired into... I just, I don't know when the reward's coming, but it's coming. And I've pushed it so many times without the reward coming. If I push it one more time, the reward might come, so I might as well push it. Well, it didn't, but I know it's coming, so I'll push it again. Does that sound familiar to you? Slot machines are one of the most addictive things in the world. They make more money every year in the United States than baseball, movies, and theme parks combined. To low cost to play, there's instant gratification, and it uses the science variable ratio schedule. It's rigged. It will reward you. It's just random, and the ratio doesn't stay the same. Does this sound familiar? Well, when I pull out my phone, and I open up Facebook or Instagram. You could do it too if you want. Have you ever noticed that you just pull the lever? You just pull the lever. You just pull the lever. Entire departments and our social media apps and programs are devoted to trying to make their service more addictive. You might say, well, what does it matter? We don't pay for it. So it's not like it's ruining like our financial, like we could be addicted to so many other things that would kind of ruin our family, you know? So there's so many other things. Uh, one of the tech giants, he used to work for one of the big tech companies, his name's Ramsey Brown, he said this, you don't pay for Facebook, Advertisers pay for Facebook. You get to use it for free because your eyeballs are what's being sold there. Another anonymous tech developer who currently works at one of the agencies says this, in order to get the next round of funding, in order to get your stock price up, the amount of time that people spend on your app has to go up. So when you put that much pressure on one number, 
you're going to start trying to invent new ways of getting people to stay hooked. There was an experiment of bowls of soup. And some of the bowls of soup, um, as you were eating it, you know, it's just like a normal bowl of soup. Pick your favorite kind of soup. Let's say chicken noodle. And you ate chicken noodle, and, and maybe it was like 20 bites of chicken noodle, and it was gone. Well, they would, they would kind of bring people in. They would say, hey, do you want some more chicken noodle? And some people would say, yeah, I'll, I'll, take, a second, I'll take a second bowl of soup, right? And then they'd come in. they eat all that. And they say, you want some more? I'm like, no, I can't eat any more soup. I just, I, I'm, I'm full. Like, I can't. One more bite of soup, and I'm done. And then other people would have the same type bowl, except that they had this little, little thing on the bottom, right, that would refill the bowl without them knowing that it was getting refilled with soup. And so it never ran out. What they found, what if, there, if there was no cue or an empty bowl that they should stop, that the, every, in, in that whole thing, those people ate 73% more soup than the folks who had the cue of, I'm finished with one bowl or I'm finished with two. That was called the endless scroll. Maybe you recognize it. You can just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling on your newsfeed. It was invented by a guy who studied the psychologist or sociological experiment of the soup bowls. And he said, how can I create an endless thing on social media to where you never have a cue, you should be done. Did you know that there are algorithms on social media that withhold the likes on your post and space them out so that when you come for a moment, you see them, and then when you hang up with it, you're like, all right, I'm done, I've seen those. It waits just a few moments and it will send you more so you come back to it because a little red icon shows up and it brings you back into the app. Did you ever notice that you now get notification for the dumbest things? Like the other day on my, on my uh, uh, Instagram, it was like, uh, what's that guy's name? Yeah, someone's going to be so mad at me, I can't. Uh, he's a soccer player, he's across the pond, he starts with an M. Messi, what's his first name? Okay, well, I couldn't hear what you said, but whatever his name is, Messi, Messi man. Uh, I got a thing saying, Messi posted, you should check it out. Messi? Are you kidding me? I don't follow him. I don't know why they thought I would like to do that. He was probably listening to me, and I said soccer one time. I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, I don't know. Do you remember when news feeds became random instead of chronological? The endless scroll, pull the lever. The result of our addiction to social media, it's endless feeds of promotion, lies, hate, discouragement, hot take opinions, mindless wanderings. I would even venture to say that it's gotten so bad for some folks that you would be willing to sit next to someone in church that you are right now unless you actually saw what they posted on Facebook. Because what I see on social media, especially because we are gearing up for election season, is you will tell someone to move to Canada in a heartbeat. You know? And then you sit next to them in church. I don't, I don't know if we really want to do a, hey, who are you voting for thing in here. Who knows what would happen? Probably nothing. We would probably actually figure out a way to say, ah, oh, it's okay. You belong here. But there's this increased courage that happens when you're on a phone or on a screen where you will say things to people that you sit next to in church and not even blink. But that's the way you behave when you're addicted to something. When you're on it, you behave differently than you would any other time. For those of you who have struggled with addiction yourself, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who have had addiction in your families, you know what I'm talking about. 
And in fact, you probably said to people, when, when he's not drinking or when she's not on this or when she's not doing this, they are so good. They're a great dad, a great mom. They're, they're, they're just a great little brother, whatever it is. They're just, they're awesome. I, and you would say to people, I wish you knew that version of him or her. And we just don't even realize that they're doing it to us and it's not costing us a thing. Or is it? Social media is often one of the greatest causes of division in our culture. Remember, social media ain't the devil unless it's our boss, unless it's our God, then it might as well be. We have to remember, when it comes to our use for social media, we've got to figure out how to use it as a tool, not allow it to use us as its tool because then we kind of become tools. But these are just symptoms of bigger problems. This hate, discouragement, lies, promotion, mindless wanderings, hot take opinions, all of those things, they're just symptoms of a bigger problem, one that's incredibly difficult to solve. It, in fact, here's the thing, uh, it's, a, it's a new problem for us, but there is an incredibly old solution for this. An incredibly old solution for this. But this is going to be pretty difficult this morning. It's going to be incredibly difficult this morning. And so before we get to the solution, because the solution is a massive ask. It's a huge ask. So before we get to it, we need to kind of prepare ourselves. And so we're, kind of, we're going to kind of do this a little backwards. Then if you were just to open your Bible and to begin to read, I'm going to kind of flip it around a little bit. We're going to start with the end first. And then we're going to work backwards a little bit, and then we'll get to the ask. And so if you have your Bibles, don't read where I'm going to be reading in a minute. Don't You'll spoil the surprise, right? Just be patient with me. We're going to start with the end. We're going to open up uh, to Paul. Paul is writing a letter to a church plant in a city called Philippi. And and this was almost an accidental church plant. It just, we don't want to go into the history of it, but Paul has a really great relationship with his church, and they are struggling with an issue we struggle with, disunity. They're struggling with discord. They're they're struggling with people at each other's throats. They're struggling with just being able to get along and and to focus on one thing. And this is where we're going to pick up in Philippians chapter 2 as he's kind of talking about this. This is the end, right? We're going to start with the solution. This is the end. This is how it ends. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him. Talking about Jesus. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the end. Did you hear that? And so Jesus, our Savior, Messiah, hung on the cross, resurrected from the grave. God is highly exalting him, giving him the name that's above every name, that in, in, there will be a moment when every single knee will bow and every single tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that moment will actually give glory to God the Father, right? That's the way this ends. So just in case, and this is why we have to start here at the end, is, is you don't actually get a choice here. Like in that moment, there's no choice left. Your choice is all before that moment happens, when we get to that moment, there's no, there's no denying it. God will be on his throne. God will be there. The, the entire glorious, whatever he's got in power and might, in that moment, he will be there. And every single knee that's ever existed on the planet will be in his presence. And then we'll have this opportunity, which we will at, be able to see, hey, you're exactly who you said you were the whole time. And then our knees will hit the ground. And we will confess that Jesus is Lord. And that will give glory to the Father. That's the way this will end, period. So, if we understand how it's going to end, might I say that the ask for how it should begin, that we should begin it before we're forced to do it. Because even though we take the knee, we bend the knee to God, to Jesus, in that moment we've already made a decision whether we want to give our lives to him. So that that decision piece of we want to have a relationship with him for the rest of our lives, that one's done. It's over with. But everyone will acknowledge it before they are separated and they go to their own ways. So maybe we should start ahead of time. Maybe we should start the habit of submitting to the will of God ahead of time. So 
Let's now start at the beginning. Let's go back to verse 1 and start there. This is Paul talking. 1 and 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So just one and two. You see, Paul understands, Paul understands just how difficult unity can be. He gets it. He understands just how difficult unity can be. And so he's trying to call, he's saying, hey, if, if you are connected to Jesus, in the end, he says, everyone is going to understand exactly who Jesus is. But if I can get you now, but before you recognize and you're in his presence and you have nothing else to do except for to get on your knees, right, and to say, hey, we, we submit. If, I can, if you can understand who Jesus is now, that helps expedite the things we can accomplish in unity together. This church that he's talking to is struggling. They can't get together on hardly anything. And these divisive issues that are tearing them apart, he's saying, hey, we need to have unity. Follow Jesus. Follow the example Jesus sets with what's going on here and what he wants in a healthy church. We've got to stop these divisive moments. And so he's calling on them. He said, hey, it, Jesus is our unifier long before we ever understand who votes for who. Long before we ever understand who thinks what should be funded or not funded. Long before any of those things, Jesus has the ability to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to put everything we have into our relationship with Jesus. Everything else just kind of trickles down out of that. I'm not going to put any other political leaning or any political thought ahead of my relationship with Jesus. And if I have a relationship with Jesus and Jesus has a relationship with me, then we can just admit, you know what, I have struggles. And part of my struggles are the things that I think and the things that I believe and the opinions that I have. I'm not saying my opinions and beliefs and my thoughts are what Jesus says. All I know is I have a relationship with Jesus, and then I have my own identity, which I will admit I struggle with. And so my thoughts and opinions might be different than yours, but it's not different when it comes to who Jesus is. And so if we can begin there, and we can make that most important, then when we get to those other things, we have a foundation to stand on. That's what Paul's trying to say. Hey, you got some differences. But if you are connected to Jesus, can I just implore you, beg you, persuade you, just urge you to find some unity? Because together, rooted in who Jesus is, you can accomplish incredible things in your city and community. You see, we're going to need to work together on this. We're going to need to work together for ourselves. We're going to need to work together for our community. We're going to need to work together for the relationships in this room. We still haven't gotten to the ask yet. He's just setting us up for it. He's saying, hey, remember, this ask is going to be based upon you have a connection to Jesus. And if you have a connection to Jesus in any way, if there's comfort, if there's peace, any of those things, if you have a relationship with Jesus, that's the, that's the, the foundation for the ask. Here's some perspective before he makes the big ask. Here it comes. Here's your perspective. Verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so he said, hey, I just want to give you a perspective, right? So if you're connected to Jesus in any way, let that be the thing that unifies us, not your thoughts and opinions and, and all those things. Like those are secondary. What you're connection, connected to Christ is that's got to be primary, and then just to give you some, a little bit of hint, the ask is so incredibly big, I want to give you some perspective that Jesus was asked to do something incredibly difficult too, that you're not alone. It's not, hey, connect yourself with Jesus, and oh yeah, everybody, every knee's going to bow to him, and so he's so pumped about it, and his life is easy because everyone bows down to him, right? He said, no, but before that happened, before that happened, Jesus actually did something to earn our bowing down to him. And he said, I just want to remind you, Jesus was asked had an incredibly difficult ask as well, where he said, hey, I need you to leave everything in this kingdom, everything. 
He was equal with God and didn't think, you know what? Because I'm equal with God, I should take use that to my advantage to make things easier for me on earth. That never entered his mind. Or maybe it entered his mind, but he never acted on it. He, he never said, you know what? Yeah, that's a great plan. He said, no, I want to be fully man so that at the end of the day, when I make my big asks of men and women, that they don't look back at me and say, yeah, well, you don't know what it's like. He could say, I know what it was like because I walked around in your flesh. I've been there. I felt the same temptations. I struggled just like you. And we have accounts of some of those struggles in the Bible. And so the perspective Paul wants us to do is, hey, I'm about to make an incredibly large ask of you, but I want you to know you're not alone. This is so difficult and so hard. But Jesus did something incredibly difficult too, so that this, this ask that I'm going to make of you will make a difference. This call for unity is coming from that perspective, that Jesus emptied himself, became a servant, humbled himself, and was obedient to God. I think you'll find when we get to the ask here in just a moment that you will have to do the same in order to say yes to it. You will have to empty yourself. You will have to become a servant. You will have to take on this humbled state. You will be required to be obedient to God if you want to say yes to what this ask is. And here it is. Verse 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking at your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. That's enormous. You know, last week we said, hey, the, the reason... The reason that this has become a God for many of us is, is we read in Proverbs that out of the, everything you do is out of the overflow of what's in your heart. And so the, the guy wrote it, he said, hey, you should guard your heart because whatever goes in there, it's going to come back out. And those things that you do with your hands is, an, is a reaction of what's happening inside of your heart. And so when we say, hey, this is going to run our lives, when technology is going to tell us what we're going to do, when it's going to say jump and we say how high, when it says, hey, you respond to me now because I put a little red, a little number on your thing. I don't care that you're in a conversation with someone else that like really needs your attention. But at this moment, this number, you don't know who it is or what it is. You just know there's a number there and it's red and you have to like get the red thing off. And so you're like, hey, I get that you're having a crisis, but I've got a red number here. So I'm just going to check this for a second. Oh, it was just messy tweeted. It's fine. You'll be okay. Where were you? Where, where were we, you know? Like, it can't become that God. It's not our boss. It doesn't tell us what to do. But so many people, it tells us what to do. I, I worked with a guy one time, and he, he you know, he, I was guilty of it, too. I have some pretty bad habits when it comes to my phone. And I'll, I mean, I just, the whole time, like, it didn't matter what was happening. He would check his phone. Like, it doesn't matter what, if it dinged or buzzed or it kind of looked like he dinged, psychologists call it like a phantom ring where you think it rings, but it actually doesn't ring, but it's your brain. Like, that would happen. He would pull it out, and, and like, it didn't matter what we were doing or what we were talking about. That was it. The only way for this not to happen is for his phone to be disconnected from it, you know? And the excuse was always, this is an excuse I hear from a lot of people, well, somebody might need me in an emergency. Well, I spent a lot of time with that guy, and the emergencies you could count on like one hand, right, that I experienced when I was interacting with him. Well, that was like a decade worth of time, you know? So how much time did we lose? How, and it wasn't just with me, like whatever, and I was guilty of the same thing, you know? I picked up some of those very same habits. Yeah, I think there are emergencies there. But you know what, there's been emergencies since the beginning of the world. And we figured out a way to, to have healthy families and to support one another and to be there without neglecting the relationships that we have right in front of our own face for the little red numbers and the dings and the dots. When we talk about what we do, that's what we're talking about. Paul is saying, hey, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing. Selfish ambition can be defined as this, primarily concerned for the advancement of oneself. 
Conceit is defined as excessive pride in oneself. And so when we talk specifically about social media, man, that's a lot. That's a huge thing. You know, there's studies that show that there are spikes in people's blood pressure when they post a new profile photo. That as they studied it, among, of everything else, that when they would post a new profile photo, like the main one that shows up in a little circle, that blood pressure would go up because you're waiting to see, will people actually like this picture? Like it does something internally to us. Like we're just, we're waiting to see. It's got a little more control on us than we think. But in humility, he says, the definition of humility, I love this, just right out of Merriam-Webster. It says this, freedom from pride or arrogance. Man, what an incredible, incredible definition. Man, if there's anything that we want from our pocket gods is freedom, right? That's it. And you might be here and you might be saying, no, nah, I ain't got that issue, bro. I ain't got that issue. I don't go and check my phone. I don't even know how to work the Facebooks. I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't. Insta, Insta what? You know, that might be you. But I'm talking to every single person here because there's no one that doesn't have someone they're interacting with where there needs to be a conversation about, hey, who controls who here? You pay the bill, but I think he's the one that's cracking the whip, making you do what you need to do or he needs you to do. My phone happens to be a he. Yours might be a she. I'm not sure. I don't know. You know? I don't know. Freedom. Freedom from pride or arrogance. I guess maybe this is the question. Let me read the ask again for you, and then I've got a pretty big question. And do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others or value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Does that verse sound like your social media? Let me ask the question, I'll read you the verse again. Does this sound like a characterization of the way you interact on social media? You ready? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Does that sound like the way you interact with your world on social media? Does someone else's stupid comments get you fired up? I can't tell you. Man, I had to make a rule a few years ago where I just can't be controversial on Facebook. Number one, because Facebook isn't a place where you can write an entire book. And typically, I talk pretty fast. And so my words, after I'm done typing them, it's like, they're not going to read these 3,000 words. They're going to read like the first two sentences and say something back that's hateful. Then I'm going to say, hey, if you look in paragraph C, part four, I would have answered this, right? That's what, but they didn't read all the way that down. And so it just, it's just a waste of time, you know? I'm not sure. Has anyone, I mean, maybe you have. Don't ruin my message today if you say yes. Has anyone changed the way someone votes by putting something on their page and saying, hey, here's the way it should be? Like, I, I haven't had, heard many stories. I, like, like, no one on the news is doing a special on someone that was like, you know, I just, I was, I was this one color in terms of red or blue. I was this one color. And then I got on Facebook one day, and I read this thing, and I was like, you know what? My entire life, I've grown up this way, and, and this person, she just, she just, or he just posted, and I'm just, I'm on the other side now. That's the way it is. I've never seen a news story do that. And the way our news is divided, Fox News or CNN, depending on if you're blue or red, would have picked up that story if it existed, right? They would have. It would be a special. It would be the headline tonight. It doesn't matter what happens in our world today. If they could find someone who switched who they voted for based off a Facebook post, they would do it. This heartwarming story at 10. <laughs> you know? That's what they would do. You're supposed to be a tool, not a boss. I don't know. If you, if, if you go to church here and you call Foundation home, can I step on your toes for a second? Do your social media interactions... Do they say you belong here? If we were to go and look through them, as I was watching, you know, as I watch your feed go, would we agree? Yeah. The people in my world, they know that I can lead them to a place where they'll belong. Because Paul's trying to tell this divided place, he's trying to say, hey, 
hey, you've got different opinions and views and those things, and, and some of those might be right, some of those might be wrong, and you might not be able to agree on what's right or wrong, but here's the thing. If you're connected to Jesus, let's put him first and allow everything else to trickle out of that is what he's trying to call us to. You're going to have an incredible opportunity over the next few months as political ads, they just start flying off the shelves, right? They're going to be everywhere. You're going to pick up a can of peanut butter and it's going to say, this message was approved by, I don't know, you know? That's what's going to happen. And I wonder if as a church, we can set the tone for Noonan. It says, hey, I ain't interested. What I'm interested in is doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, in the example of Jesus, I'm just going to value other people above me. And not looking to my own interests, but to the interests of others, I'm just, I'm going to submit to Jesus. That I'm going to have freedom from pride and arrogance. Because at the end of the day, the greatest thing that I can boast in is my relationship with Jesus, not my opinions or my views. At the end of the day, here's the truth. Social media's goal is to make you addicted to itself. It's working. They're good at their job. The byproduct is not that you are going broke by buying everything they advertise to you. It's that collectively our humanity is breaking. That's what's happening. It wasn't their intent. You know what's someone's job, someone incredibly smart's job? To analyze how you as an individual or a demographic respond to ads on social media and then for them to go tweak them and make them better. And they don't stop. They don't stop, period. Uh, maybe you thought I was going to say they don't stop until. There's no until. They don't stop. Their goal is 100% addiction and engagement because that's what the people that pay them ask for. You know those people that are incredibly driven and can never get good enough? Those are the people that are making sure that the apps that we use keep us on the apps. And every single time when it goes from engagement and it goes up a percentage point, in their mind these endorphins are going off and say, man, look at that. I kept them on for an extra 30 seconds this quarter, and I ain't finished yet. There is no celebration where we've achieved it, where we've reached the peak. They will just continue to go. And as much time of your life that you will give it, when the little red number pops up, they'll take it. They won't even say thank you. They'll just take it. So the question is, how do we get a handle on it? Because I truly believe that the way some of us interact on social media is a result of the addiction that's happening with us, and it's not who we really are. And so if we want to be incredibly practical, we need, to, we need to be aware of a couple of insights. Here's the first one. Many tech insiders from social media giants have admitted they will not allow their children to have the very platforms they have helped to create because of their intended addictive purpose. Let that sink in for a moment. From Instagram and Facebook, people that create those and continue to create them have made a decision not for my kids because I know what its real purpose is. And I know that we are incredibly good at our job. And if we're not good, I'll get someone who is. And we will continue to do that until I find the person that's the best at it because at the end of the day, you've got billions and billions and billions to spend. And I'm selling your eyes. And I don't care if your eyes are 60 years old, 80 years old, or eight years old. They're all for sale. And the person that's buying them got real money. Let it sink in for a moment. How do we stop the addiction? I don't know if I've got a great answer. I don't know. I will tell you, I had something else planned for today. And then um, I took part in the the seven-day detox um, 
from this past week that was our challenge for last week. And I had something else planned for today. Uh, but just in my time with, without my phone this week, I discovered something that I, it might just be me. Um, and so because of that, it's, it's kind of a, a tricky little thing we're going to ask or invite people into. Um, and I, I'll be honest, I don't know if, if a ton of you did the seven-day detox. Uh, I know we had a bunch of people that did. Um, yesterday was a tough day, uh, and I, I won't be transparent with you. I, I did have to make two phone calls yesterday, um, and so I didn't make it a full 24 hours. Both those phone calls came late in the day, so I made it over 16 hours, um, but I just had two that I couldn't get around. The, the next thing I want to kind of, you know, bring in front of you, just like I said, transparency, is there was this one particular day, I can't remember if it was day two or three or four, or they, they kind of run it together, but there was a day when we turned notifications off, like there was no notifications on, and I haven't turned them back on yet, and it's been incredible. Like if you, if I, you go back and track your screen time or my screen time on social media sites, it's dramatically reduced because that little red button isn't popping up saying, hey, there's something for you. I just turned them off. And so today, I want to ask if you will go with me in an experiment that I would like to then send to a few other churches the results. It's just super simple, right? The 21-day no notification challenge. Uh, and the way it's going to do this is I just want as many people who are saying, hey, here's the deal. On my social media apps, that's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, uh, what are the other ones? Snapchatters, uh, Twitter, Twitter bug. Um, it's not called Twitter bug, it's called Twitter. Um, nobody laughed at my bug thing, though, that's fine. Um, whatever the other social medias are, that you go into your phone and you just say, hey, don't allow notifications on any of them. Um, and you just turn them all off. And just for 21 days, I just want you to think of, like, just sit in that. And then I'm going to send you a survey at the end that's got five or six questions um, all of them will be probably multiple choice, and then there'll be probably a, a paragraph box at the end that just says, hey, give us some more information. Um, I just want to see if it makes a difference. Uh, maybe I'm the only one that has made a huge difference. Maybe you discovered it as well. Um, but the way we're going to do that is you can do it right now on the app. Um, I believe it's up there. Christian, is it up right now? Yes. Uh, it's up right now. If you can go to the Church Center app, you can sign up to be a part of the 21-day no, no, no notification challenge as a part of our Pocket God series. And so that's going to be the rest of January. It actually goes like, I think, one day into February. And so I'll send you that survey on a Saturday, um, and that's when it'll go out. And I just want to get some feedback. As I was taking a look at it, I was like, man, we've got to have something practical because our phones are so practical. And if we're going to sit up here and say, hey, we need to live in the freedom and this humility, if we need to kind of teach ourselves, hey, this is how we respond, I mean, what's, if we can get back to the root cause of that, I think it's the constant engagement that fuels the addiction and the endorphins in our brain, that that's really where we, we be kind of lose our filter because we've just been in Facebook the whole time. We've read so many comments. It's like, All right, that's it. I can't take any more. Here it comes. But if we don't have the notifications, if it's not dragging us into it, which is the, it's the first thing that says, hey, pull the lever. This notification is here, so pull the lever, right? And it's going to just send them to you in random bursts. Even after you just left, it's got a timer that starts. It says, hey, in 45 seconds or a minute and a half, we're going to randomly send you some more notifications that already have occurred. We're just not telling you about them because we want you to re-engage it. If we stop that, then you get to decide. You get to be the boss that says, hey, you know what? I'm going to check Facebook in the morning 15 minutes, and then I'm done right? I'll check it again at lunch maybe. Or before I go to bed, I'll jump on and I'll check and see what's, what's what. But then you're just not sitting there looking at it. Oh, there's something new. There's something new. There's something new, you know? Take back a little power. Say, hey, I tell you what to do. You don't tell me what to do. When your little red number goes off, I have this compulsion to check it, but I don't want that. So I'm going to say, you don't get a red number anymore. You've abused it. You've, you've taken your license to be on my, in my pocket, and you abused it, so you don't get it anymore. I'm turning you off. I'll use you as a tool. You won't be my boss. I think all of us have some soul searching to do when it comes to our relationship with social media. If you've got kids, stop searching. Make a decision. Stop searching. Don't waste any more time trying to decide. If you want to take more time to decide, shut it down and then take some time to decide. But come up with a plan. 
a plan that you feel comfortable with, a plan that puts them in a place that says, hey, you know what? I feel like we value other people more than ourselves. We're in a place of humility. We don't get on and look at other people as less than us because they have a different opinion. And we treat people in a way that says, you belong here. And if that's not what you're seeing on your feeds, then change it. Because that's powerful. It's not your boss. It's your tool.